Andrew Matthews, in his book, Being Happy, talks about how our mind works in pictures. What is said, or what we think, is transformed into a picture in our mind. Another concept he mentions is that our mind is not capable of going in reverse. Therefore, what we think is the direction we will move. So if what we think we picture, there too we will go. The mind is a powerful tool, so we need to be delicate in what we fill it with because we will move our life in the direction of those pictures. Matthew gives a couple of illustrations to make the point. A family goes to church out to eat for spaghetti on Sunday morning. The young boy is wearing a new white, crisp, clean shirt. The mom says to the boy, don't get spaghetti on your shirt. Don't get spaghetti on your shirt. What does the boy picture? Spaghetti on his shirt. The mom's words paint the picture in the boy's mind. So what happens? Yep, boy gets spaghetti on his shirt. If the mom had changed her words and said, keep your shirt clean, keep your shirt clean, what is the picture that the boy would have had in his mind? A clean shirt. So there was a higher probability that that shirt would have stayed clean. Another example is, I don't wanna forget my keys. I don't wanna forget my keys. What do you picture? Forgetting your keys. Reverse just a few words and change that picture. I need to remember my keys. I need to remember my keys. What do you picture? Remembering your keys. It's a simple change of words. Change the picture in our mind and then it changes the outcome. And it changes the direction that we move our life towards that picture. I have put this to theory and practice in my own life. Instead of worrying about remembering something, I will either write it down and put it by the door, or I say to myself, I need to remember my briefcase. I need to remember that book. It's positive ways and I picture remembering that item. And most of the time, I remember it. Well, Jesus was well ahead of our psychological understanding of the human mind and heart. He knew we needed illustrations and pictures in order to understand. So he taught in parables or stories that people could relate to and, the, and picture in their mind. He also knew how to get a crowd's attention. We find at the beginning of the parable of the sower from Matthew 13, instead of allowing distractions of people getting too close to him, Jesus gets away from them and he gets in the boat. And the first thing he says to get their attention is, listen. He kind of reminds me of parenting when we try to get our kids' attention to get them to change something or do a different behavior. We say, listen. I said, close the door. Listen, I said, shut off the light. We've all done it. Often as kids and adults, we get so distracted that we fail to listen. We get addicted to our text messages, emails, game stimulation. We fa fail to hear those around us. And we certainly are not totally listening. My kids used to hate it when I would think that I could multitask. I'd be typing away on my computer, staring off at a wall. They'd be talking to me and I'd act like I was hearing them. And they would say, stop doing that, it's creepy. But I believed I could multitask. What's really kind of funny, I love it that now I've watched them both do the same thing, multitask and pretend that they're listening to your conversation. We don't hear that way. We don't truly listen to someone unless we give them our attention. As I've gotten older and I've lost hearing in one ear, I value being able to listen. Oftentimes I have to turn my head to someone so that I can hear them out of my good ear to listen to what they are saying. 
this crowd in front of Jesus, the only distraction they had was the ocean waves and him in a boat. But Jesus still wanted to get their attention. So he emphasized the word, listen. In today's parable, Jesus paints his message in pictures that the crowd could understand, for they were all farmers. They knew the terrain, they knew their land. They knew if they scattered seeds around, that sure, the birds were gonna pick up some of them. They knew what type of soil the seeds would flourish in for the long haul and where they probably would not make the greatest crop. This parable story can go in many different directions and ways of thinking, and we could do sermons on many avenues of this parable. In my lifetime, unfortunately, I have seen the evangelical approach to it sometimes, using it to judge people or judge their faith or pressure them to bring more people to the numbers at church. But that's not what this story is about. I think this story is not just about the seed. For the seed never changes in the story. It's the same seed wherever it's thrown. It can be on rocks, it can be on rough terrain. But if we think of the land being our hearts, then we need to focus on where it lands, where the seeds are landing. If we remember Jesus' greatest commandment, to love your God with all of your heart and to love your neighbor as yourself, that to me is the seed. The seed is love. The seed of God's love does not come with conditions or stipulations or judgments. It's just pure love. Think about it. If that was the message of the seed of love consistently throughout time, scattered and cultivated in all cultures, religions, nations, and denominations, we would not have wars, crimes, abuse, distrust, unjust systems, famines, poverty, or hatred. For all of those have become the weeds that tangle and strangle out the seed of love. It is almost impossible to trust and believe you are loved unconditionally when you have been judged or beaten down or segregated or abused. The picture in your mind has then been damaged. The wrong words have been spoken and we have centuries and decades to overcome repainting the picture of not only what love is, but who God is. This parable asks us to examine our own hearts, not to judge other people's hearts or life, but to look at the things in our hearts that might have choked out the freedom to love one another or stifled our ability to feel joy or scorched our soul, removing kindness and patience and gentleness. The truth is life is rough, it's tough, and often it's not fair. But Jesus doesn't want that to be the picture we have in our mind. He wants us to overcome this world's challenges with a new perspective of rich soil and new depth of understanding of his love. How many lives have really been richly or positively influenced through scolding or shaming or pressure or judgment? None. What that does is it creates rebellion and fear and distrust, and it builds walls in our heart. It creates hardened hearts of stone, weeds of tangled thinking, and thorns of retaliation, and continues the cycle of tainted pictures. My grandfather was a simple, small construction company called J. Jack Smith Construction, with one or two guys who worked for him. He mostly did kitchen remodels, and back in the 
50s and 60s, the new thing called family rooms with brick fireplaces. I saw several of those additions and they were beautiful and people love them. But come to find out, it was not my grandfather's design for he was just the carpenter. I was told he would take my grandmother to each site and she was there with the vision for how it should be built. Those new remodels were the result of not one, but two people. It often takes more than one person to transform something into new and better. Jesus became the vision planner the seed spreader, the picture painter, and the carpenter of new ground in love. He paints pictures through the parables of good outcomes, of how he wants the world to be, and how he hopes each of us will live life. His words were kindness and gentleness and patience and love. Those were the seeds he wanted to scatter. We are all our own carpenters of our hearts and our thoughts and the pictures that we paint in our mind. Sometimes we need to do a remodel job on the old ways of thinking. We need to repair the damage that has been done, perhaps forgiveness and paint a new picture in our mind of the way we want to live and how we want to treat others. We may need to change some of our wording of how we, how we see ourselves and the world around us. We may need to rephrase what we say to others. So we paint the seeds of love in their mind's picture. Jesus said, listen. We need to listen to his words of love over the world, words of the world. We need to listen to others and understand their journey and why their hearts may be hardened and why it might be hard for them to trust. And when we listen, in doing so, we can begin to scatter the seeds of love and repair hearts and repaint pictures.